Hi, and welcome to Math for Honors. I'm Kirk Weiler, and today we're going to be looking at quiz number four, marking period number two. Um, this was a quiz that I gave today, and it was primarily on implicit derivatives and differentiability. And if you've taken calculus before, if you're taking calculus and you've seen those two topics, they're, they're not two of the easier ones, especially in the first week back from Thanksgiving break. So my apologies to my students, you guys. I'm, I'm sorry, but it's kind of the way the timing uh, landed for us, if you will. So what I thought I'd do on this video is take a look at the two hardest problems on that quiz. And of course, this is also to give a little bit of a dry run on the, the video equipment to see if I can pull off just one of these videos. I think this is take number three. So let's take a look at the first problem. In this problem, we've got the implicit derivative. And we've got a curve that is defined implicitly by y squared divided by x minus 2y equals negative 1. Okay, remember though, that is the function. Implicitly defined, but it is the function. And what we're asked in part a is to show that dy dx, whoops, dy dx, let me just get my pencil on, um, the slope of the tangent line is given by this expression. All right, so this is a classic implicit derivative. Now, unlike an explicit derivative, we always start implicit derivatives by taking the derivative of both sides of the equation. This isn't calculus. This is just fundamentally the way that algebra works, right? Whatever we do to one expression, we do to the other expression. So I'm gonna take the derivative with respect to x on both sides of this equation. Now, luckily for us, derivatives play nice with addition and subtraction. So this derivative is just going to distribute over that subtraction. So we're going to have d dx of y squared divided by x minus d dx of 2y. And I think I'm going to dispense with this right away. The derivative of a constant is 0. All right, so now is where the implicit derivative fun comes in, especially because we have to handle y squared divided by x. Some of my students chose to do this with the product law and did it quite nicely. Others sort of struggled with that because of the x to the negative 1. Our natural inclination should be to go with the quotient rule, but it's a quotient rule that's got an implicit derivative within it. Now remember how the quotient rule works, right? We're going to take the derivative of the numerator, but that is a function, right? y is a function, so we're going to use the chain rule and get 2y times y prime. But then we have to multiply it by the denominator, x. That's just the first part of the uh, quotient rule. We're then going to subtract the derivative of the denominator, but that's easy, right? That's just 1. And we have to multiply it by the numerator, y squared. And we're going to divide that all by the denominator squared. Some of my students forgot that x squared, and that, of course, that course had a problem later on when we were working through the, with the algebra minus now the derivative of 2y, and that's going to be 2 times y prime equals 0. Now, as always with implicit derivatives, we have to sort of unbury y prime. We have to solve for it. One of the problems here is that we've got that annoying x squared in the denominator. So we're going to take care of that pretty easily by multiplying both sides of this equation by x squared. Oh, I don't think I can really even fit it into the screen. Oh, well. Good enough, right? We do that because when we then distribute the x squared, it'll cancel this one. And of course, we'll have to multiply that. But what's nice is that we then get an equation that doesn't have any fractions in it anymore. So 2y, y prime x minus y squared minus 2x squared y prime equals 0. All right, now as always with implicit derivatives, what we tend to do is we tend to take things like this, which don't have a y prime attached to them, and move them on the other side. And then we leave the things with the y prime, let's say on the left-hand side, and factor that y prime out. So I'm going to do that all at once. I'm going to factor the y prime out of this term, and I'm going to write it in alphabetical order because I almost can't help myself there. I'm going to factor a y prime out of here and get negative 2x squared. And then I'm going to move the negative y squared over to the other side, and it'll become a positive y squared. I can finish this problem off then by dividing by 2xy minus 2x squared on both sides. This is the non-exciting part of the video, as if any part's really all that exciting. I like it. Maybe not this part. This is kind of like a dry mechanical part. I am fascinated by the chain rule aspect of it all, but that's me. Let's really just highlight this. Oops, let me get some, ah, come on, red pen. There we go. I don't want you forgetting this 
thing right here, which is of course just what they told me I was going to get, gives me the slope of the tangent line at any point, right? Slope of the tangent. All right, but like most implicit derivatives, in order to find the slope of the tangent, what I need is both an x and a y coordinate, right? That's what this says. The slope of the tangent depends on both the x and the y coordinate at a particular point. So now part b, we're asked to write the equation of the tangent line to the curve at x equals 1. Now that is a question that my students have seen a million times, and my hope had been that they would go on autopilot here, that they literally say, all right, implicit, explicit, I don't care. I've seen this question a lot. I'm just going to write down y minus y1 equals x minus x1. And let me just uh, let me get rid of that y and actually make it look a little more like a generic y. All right. Because once we write it down in this form, it's just a fill in the blank game. We need three things. x1, the x coordinate of tangency, m, the slope of the tangent line, and y1, which is the y coordinate of tangency. Now, we've got the x1. We almost always do. It's sitting right here. So that's good. One down. All right. Now, we know that that's going to give us the slope. But again, keep in mind that the slope depends not only on the x-coordinate of tangency, but also the y-coordinate. And that's the thing that we're missing here. Now, if this was an explicit equation, we would just take the input, x equals 1. We'd throw it into the explicit function, and it would just pop out the y-value for us. It's not as easy this time, but it's still the same idea. This is the equation that relates the inputs to the outputs of this function. And so if I know the input, I'm going to still put it into this equation. Oops, y squared divided by 1. Right? I'm putting in x equals 1. And now I need to use this function rule to calculate my output. You need to know what you know and know what you don't know. And you need to know that you can solve a quadratic. And you should have tools at your ready disposal to solve them. Things like the zero product law, the quadratic formula. But what you don't have is the negative one product law. You can't look at this, factor this side, and do the negative one product law. You've got to go on autopilot. You've got to bring that negative one to the other side and then think to factor it. Very important. So y minus one, y minus one equals 0, y equals 1. And that's nice because it does two things for us. It gives us the point of tangency, which is 1, 1, and it gives us a y coordinate to substitute up here in the, uh, the slope. But we, we do have two of the three, right? We have y1, we have x1, we just need the slope now. All right, so we're going to put 1, 1 in. So we're going to have 1 for y, 1 for x, 1 for y, 1 for x again squared, but of course that doesn't make any difference. And something very curious happens. We get 1 divided by 2 minus 2, or 1 divided by 0. And this is where you have to really just sit back, gather your wits, and say to yourself, what does that mean? What a lot of students came to is the following conclusion. We must have, and they were correct about this, a vertical tangent line here. A vertical tangent. Now, unfortunately, quite a few students concluded at that point that, well, the equation must not exist. But that's not true. It is certainly true that a vertical line has a slope that doesn't exist. And what we really mean by that is that a slope that can't be quantified because slope is a number. But vertical tangent lines certainly do have, they certainly, they certainly do have equations, right? If I had a curve that looked like this, let me draw the tangent line in in red. And I drew in, I don't know why I thought that was going to work better, kind of crouching down low. Um, but if I have a vertical tangent line, it certainly has an equation. This one, by the way, was vertical at the point 1, 1. And so therefore, this thing has an equation x equals 1. So one of the great ironies of this problem is that when I asked what was the equation of the tangent line at x equals 1, the answer was x equals 1. Kind of weird. I know. Let me get rid of this text, and let's go on to the next screen. OK, the other more challenging problem on this quiz was number 3, which was the classic differentiability problem. We've got a piecewise function, in this case consisting of two parabolas, and we want to make it differentiable at the cutoff point. It's going to be differentiable everywhere else. 
So make sure we're back to blue. All right, let's do it. Now we talked about this quite a few times. In order to have this function be differentiable at the cutoff point, we have to make sure two things are true. We have to make sure that it's continuous there, and we have to make sure that there are no corners. No corners. All right. When we combine those two conditions together, we're going to have a differentiable function. All right. So the way that we make it continuous is quite simple. We have to make sure that the y value coming from the left is equal to the y value coming from the right at x equals 1, our nice evaluation bar. So we just substitute 1 in there, and we get a minus 1 equals 1 minus h quantity squared. Now a lot of students get a little bit confused about what to do with this expression, and rightly so, because here we've got something that's got two variables, uh, not two variables, I'm sorry, two unknown constants in it, two unknown parameters. Um, so what that actually gives us is a lot of freedom. We are free to choose one of these variables or one of these constant values and then we would get another one. And what it really means is that there's an infinite number of pairs that will make these two curves meet up. But they would often or almost always meet up at a corner. So let's eliminate the corners. In order to eliminate the corners, what we have to do is set the slope coming from this direction equal to the slope coming from this direction. And for the slopes, we need the derivatives. A lot of my students got confused about how to take the derivative when there was this a and this h there. And that is that can be confusing. What I do tell them, though, is to just grab a value of a. Think to yourself, how would I take the derivative of 3 minus x squared? Well, the derivative of 3 is 0. And the derivative of x squared is negative 2x. And so it doesn't make a difference whether it's 3 or whether it's a. The derivative of this curve is negative 2x. Let's do the same thing here. Let's pick a value for h. Let's say that h was 5, right? If we were to take the derivative of this, we would do it with the chain rule most likely, right? And it would look like that. In the case where there's an h, it's going to be 2 times x minus h. I'm going to leave off the times 1 right now because obviously it's irrelevant. So in order not to have a corner, we need to have these two equations equal to each other again when x is equal to 1. One of the beautiful things about this particular problem is that the a has gone away in the corner situation. In other words, a, a is irrelevant. It makes no difference to whether there's a corner or not. So in fact, we can now solve this pretty easily. Putting 1 in for x, we'll get the following. Keep your wits about you. Just be careful about your algebra. Negative 2 is equal to 2 minus 2h. Subtracting 2 from both sides, negative 4 is equal to negative 2h and h is 2. All right. Now, given that there's no a, what that means is I could choose any a I want right now, and I wouldn't have a corner as long as h is 2. But most likely, I wouldn't be continuous. So when we pair this condition up with this condition, and that's going to be very easy to do because all we have to do is substitute h equals 2 in. So we do a minus 1 equals 1 minus 2 quantity squared. That almost looks like a squared. Anyway, this is going to be right negative 1, squared is 1, and a is also 2. So when a is 2, and when h is 2, eesh, sorry about that, when a is 2 and when h is 2, what happens is we've got both the continuity condition satisfied and the no corner condition. And that is going to make the function differentiable. It's really, really neat if you can sketch this thing. Um, I'm going to just clear this screen up, hopefully. Ah, I did it, yay! And I'm gonna actually open up just a whiteboard because I think that's gonna be easier to show it on. I asked my students to graph this on a given interval, and really this was to reinforce um, a technique that we had learned on our graphing calculators the previous day, which was how to, how to graph a piecewise function. Anyway, the, the, the method isn't really relevant right now. What I like about this is that you've got this concave down parabola that then smoothly transitions into a concave up parabola. And if we were to just sort of graph this thing and not know what the equation was, we wouldn't think that it was piecewise. In fact, we would likely think that it was a cubic with an inflection point right about there. And the cool thing is it does have an inflection point there, but not one where the second derivative is zero. For a quadratic, the second derivative is always a constant. It's always twice a, whatever the a is, you know, the, the leading coefficient. 
And so whatever this, whatever this concavity would be, you know, it's probably a concavity of negative two, y double prime. And this has, I think, a concavity of two. And so you get a transition in concavity, but no location, no location where y double prime equals zero. So that actually doesn't happen on this curve. Anyway, that's it. That's our entire, um, or at least the hard part of the quiz, I think. There we go cleared the screen out back here. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you for giving the first shot of the video a good, good go. Um, hopefully in the future we'll get more of these types of screencasts so they, uh, they um, look a little bit better than what we were, we were having before. Uh, take care for now. Until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.